you know how everybody talks about what is the key to success. You know, the key to success is marry the right person, save money, work mm -hmm. hard, go to school, get a degree, love people, faith, God. Uh, you hear so many different things. And we were having this debate one time. Uh, and I would ask everybody, it's just the basic question everybody, what's the key to success? What is it? I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Years later, I said, I, in my mind, the biggest key to success, almost anybody I see that takes it to a whole different level, the highest levels, the difference between them and other people is their sequencing. And what I mean by sequencing is the following. So you and I may have the same vision of what we want to do in life, okay? You want to get here, I want to get here. This mm -hmm. could be anything. We both want to build a billion dollar company, mm -hmm. fine. We both want to be uh, building a company that does 100 million a year. We both want to go into uh, a football. We both want to go play at the highest level. We both want to go out there and be great sales. Whatever it may be, that's the ultimate, right? If my order of steps I take to go here isn't as efficient as yours because your sequencing is better, you're going to get there faster than I am. And I may not even, uh, never even get there because I'm trying to do move 14 on move three. And that's the most common thing that you see. One day I woke up, I was in a relationship, and this is, I'm 26 years old, 27 years old, 26, 25 years old, and I'm trying to get my business going. I wake up six o'clock in the morning, I get a text. Babe, I have to tell you this, as much as I love you, I don't see this relationship going anywhere. Wow. One of those texts, because I think my mom is right. You love your business more than you love me. And I barely see you. I only see you once a week. You're working so hard. First text. Then <laughs> message. I press the message to listen to it. My mom. You know, there used to be a time they used to love me. And you would call me and tell me you love wow. me. What happened to those? What happened to my little son that used to love his mother? Like, call oh, me every my, day. This hug is me. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the part. So, so now I got a breakup on the line. I got a guilt trip for my mom. That's still 602 right now. <laughs> then I get an email. You haven't even got out of bed yet. I haven't even gotten out of bed yet. I, then I get an email that's been in the uh, 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 box for a while, and I look at it. <laughs> it's from my number one client that I, had, I was about to expect like a $15,000 commission, and that's a lot of money at that yeah. time. And my number one client says he's leaving me for the following reasons. And then at the same time, the next email is my agent saying I resign. My number one agent wow. resigns. This all happens before 605, 610. So I'm in bed, anxiety is high, panic is high. I have no idea what to do. In that moment, all I thought about is, what are my next five moves? What do I need to do next? From that moment on, everything I did with business, I would ask myself, I'm gonna do this next, my next 10, 15 moves. Or what would this guy do? Mm. This guy that built an empire, what would he do? What are we gonna do here? What can I do to be better than this guy? What can I do to be more efficient than him? What can I do to speed up the process to get here? But everything came down to your next five moves. So you're asking a question, is the first move the uh, most important? Absolutely it is. If you don't know your next move, your next move can hurt the chances of you even getting to the fifth move. Yeah. So it's always your next move what that matters the, the most. What is the next move that everyone should be thinking about? So the first thing you have to do is you, you got to, last night I'm at Rafi's place and I'm having dinner with my three buddies. None of us are supposed to do anything in life. One of them is Stephen Affo. They're running a $300 billion a year business. Steve was the Michael Jordan of our high school. Wow. Okay. He's a great basketball player, but we're all 2.0 GPA kids. Right. And our moment Makes was- great salesman. Yes. 2.0 guys. <laughs> yes. And Armand was always a fighter. He would always get in trouble. Like he was a guy that, he's a five, six guy, you don't want to fight. Like <laughs> you'd go to a party, you know the smallest guy you go to a party and this five, six guy would go to a party and he would stand there and he would say, that guy's looking at me. I'm like, bro, he's not looking at you. No, I know he's looking at me. He's looking at me. I'm like, I promise you he's not looking. He's the kind of guy that would walk up and just punch the guy in the face. Just for no reason. Just for no reason. What is the matter with you, right? That's his wiring. Yeah. But we're all together yesterday. Now, we all have kids. We have two, three, and Armand has four kids. We're sitting and we're talking. Armand runs Rafi's Place. If you've been to Rafi's Place, the restaurant in Glenda, if you've not been, you got to go. It's the best Middle, Middle Eastern restaurant. Wow. We're, just, we're sitting there yesterday and we're having all these conversations. Challenges men go through, whether it's marriage, money, health, what happens at 41, all, everything that you don't want to talk publicly that men are insecure about, we just talk about it right there, right, collectively. And the biggest thing that I talked with one of my friends yesterday is, listen, your number one move is you identifying who you want to be. Mm. Not, not who Tiffany wants to be, not yeah. who, it's who do you want to be. Not, not what Patrick wants to be, not what Bobby wants, not what your older brother, sister, mom, dad, who do you want to be? 
if you and I can figure out who we want to be, and it's as transparent and as clear as possible, I don't have to compare myself against your success. Now, here's a problem though. Say for instance, I sit there and I say, honestly, I just want to be a person that's just a regular person and I'm glad if I make 80 grand a year, 100 grand a year, I have a nice place, I'm married, I'm happy, my kids are with me, I have good relationships, I'm totally happy. If you say that, if that's what you want to be. If you say that's what you want to be. But if you say I want something else and you're not doing it, then what? Exactly, but watch this one here. If you say that's what you want to be and you're content with that life, but behind closed doors, your buddy Lewis House is making millions, he's doing great, he's all over the place, people are talking about it. If an ounce of envy or jealousy comes in, you either weren't being honest with yourself because that's mm -hmm. not exactly who you want it to be, mm -hmm. or you gotta ask the decision. Am I living my life or his life? That's mm -hmm. the toughest thing to do, right? Toughest thing to do. Now, the, the other side of it is that, let's just say you got a big upside. You know, in sports, a lot of times, you know, Stephen A. Smith did an interview the other day and they asked him about Vince Carter and it was the toughest question what, that was asked. They said, so, uh, Vince Carter, he just announced 23 years of retirement, he's leaving the NBA. Stephen A., what can you say about Vince Carter's legacy? Okay, now I don't know if you guys know who Vince Carter is. This guy dunked yeah, over the amazing. seven footer in the Olympics. The guy amazing. retired afterwards. He got a contest for, with the elbow. Got a dunk contest Everybody. with the elbow. Sick what he was doing in Toronto, McGrady. It's just beautiful when you watch this guy play. I remember one time he dropped 50 in the playoffs. You thought this guy's going to win the championships. Yeah. And he came from Tar Heels, North Carolina. Yeah. He's going to be the next Mike. But here's what Stephen A said about Vince Carter. Very difficult. He said, his, you know how Stephen A does his thing. He's <laughs> yeah, just kind of like, you know. <laughs> and he, he, you know, he typically is quick to give the answer. One second goes by. Mm. Two seconds goes by. Five seconds goes by. He still hasn't said a word. Then all of a sudden he says, well, I got to tell you, this is a good brother. I love this man. He's a great man. You know, he goes into building him up. And then he says, but it is the most unfulfilled talent we've ever seen in the history of the NBA. Really? He says, this man should have been competing with the Kobe's of the world, the LeBron's of the world, the Jordan's of the world, but we never saw it. I wish I would have seen the best of him. And you, it's like a minute and 13 seconds. It's so awkward. Oh. If Vince Carter watches that and it doesn't bother him, more, more power to you because you were happy to be in the NBA and you were cool with that. But if you watch that and it bothers you, you know deep down inside he could have done more. Mm. So you as the individual have to make a decision. Either I'm going for all the, I want all the marbles and I'm willing to go be embarrassed, lose public hum humiliation after another one after until I get there, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna live a simple life and I'm okay with this. But yeah. you have to be clear about that. That's step number one. Okay, and what's step two? Once you're, once you're identifying that part, then it's figuring out your own talents that you have. Mm -hmm. And once I know my talents, where can my talents be used? You know, if you're wow. a numbers guy, what industry can use your talents? Well, maybe it's finance, economy, investment banker, you know, maybe it's on that side. If, if it's a creative side, Maybe I'm gonna go be on the marketing side. Maybe I wanna be behind the scenes. I don't wanna be in front of camera. I wanna be the support person. Then, then you say, well, I'm not a good number one guy. I'm a good number two person. I'm a number three person. Then you have to find out your positioning at the, po at the point of your life. Tom was the former president of our company, PHP. Uh, one of the best decisions was hiring this guy. Mm. When I hired Tom and brought him on board, he uh, introduced me to Vistage years ago. Vistage is kind of like a YPO, EO. You're familiar with YPO. Yes. So Vistage is, an element of that, it's very similar, but it's a little bit older crowd. YPO is a little bit younger. Vistage has 50, 60-year-olds, right? And I, I want to be around 60-year-olds. So he introduced me to Vistage. And over the years, we became very good friends before I hired him. And I said, so, hmm. Tom, let me ask you a question. In your life, you, you guys sold Jam Dad for $780 million. You got a massive exit. But you were the number six guy. How come you don't want to be the number one guy? He says, good question. He gave me the best answer. He says, you realize I'm 54 years old at the time when we were talking. He says, uh, it took me 54 years to realize I'm not a good number one. Hmm. 54 years. 54 years to realize I'm not a good number one. What would have happened if you had realized that at 30? That's the point. Every one of his biggest checks he ever got, he was the number five, the number four, or the number, every time he was number one, the company didn't do well. Interesting. So sometimes we want to be number one, but maybe you're not a number one. Sometimes you want to be MJ, but maybe you're Scotty. Sometimes you want to be MJ and Scotty, but maybe you're John Paxson and Steve Kerr. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're somebody that later on is going to be the general manager of the you know, Chicago Bulls. Your name is uh, John Paxson. Maybe you're going to be a great coach years later winning three out of five championships. Your name is Steve Kerr, but 
you got to play mm. your game with your strength. So and, once, and in the season of life. Exactly. You know and I mean? in the season of life. Because you may be a number six right now, but you may eventually be a good number one. Maybe in, it's just in not a different time. role in and a different, different package. Yes. And a, yes, but it's the sequencing, man. Everything mm. is sequencing. You what know? does sequencing mean for you? What is Se that? Sequencing to me means, okay, you, if you wake up every day, you have a sequence of what you do. Okay, like what's the first thing you do when you wake up? Most of meditate. Okay, what's the next thing you do? Make my bed. And then what's the next thing you do? Brush my teeth, shower. Okay, that's a sequence. Yeah. Okay, so that, now what if I wake up and the first thing I do is I shower first, okay? Then I go eat, then I put my clothes on, then I go to work and I say sometime throughout the day I'm going to meditate. I just mess the whole sequence mm -hmm. up. What is the foundation of what I'm starting the day with, right? Yeah. What is the sequence of what I'm going to be doing next? If every decision you're about to make next, whether it's marriage, having kids, business partnership, a joint venture, if everything you did, you stepped away from the world, your girl, your mom, your dad, your peers, your family, you went to a restaurant, you sat there with a piece of paper saying, okay, I'm thinking about marriage. What do I need to do next? What's the next move I need to make? Mm. Then you go, I don't know if that's number one. I think that's number three. And you play that game. It's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> It's fascinating. It's like playing chess. It's yeah. like, you know, these master chess players, they know their next 10 or 15 moves. The amateurs were like, oh, sh here we go. This is what I'm going to do. You know, and these guys are like, yeah, yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. They it's all see it in the future. It's all sequencing. But it takes the steps to get to the future. You can't just jump to the future. I mean, it's the story of Bob Iger, it's the story of uh, Ted Turner, it's the story of Kirk Kerkorian. You know, how a Kirk Kerkorian went from being a regular guy in Bakersfield who didn't graduate past eighth grade you know, goes and pays a guy a dollar to let him fly a plane and eventually becomes a pilot for Bugsy with the mob and eventually goes and becomes a pilot, buys TWA, turns it into a big company, sells it for a few hundred million dollars, then decides to go to Vegas, then he decides to buy a couple of hotels, then he buys 80 acres of property across the street from Tropicana, mm. then he buys MGM, he's not the founder of MGM, he turns it into what it is, dies at 98 years old as a multi-billionaire, gives a billion dollars to Armenia after the earthquake of 1988. This is all sequencing, man. Hmm. This is all sequencing when you go through it. Everything is sequencing. Yeah. And when you look at it that way, you tend to make better decisions.